So there's an insert in the bulletin if you'd like to follow along. Do I have to hit start slideshow? It seems like I should remember this by now, but here I am. I'm just going to take a sip of water while we work on that. We actually more or less just had the conversation as to whether or not I was capable and Oh, there we go. All right. The answer obviously is no, I'm not. Um, but I think from this point out, I can, I can work the remote. So uh, in a verse that is likely familiar to a lot of you, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be com uh, competent equipped for every good work. So the words of scripture, according to this verse, are initiated by God. They don't originate uh, with us. They start with God. They're God-breathed. And the role that scripture plays in our lives is for teaching, for rebuke, and for encouragement. So what this means is that scripture is one of the means through which God presses in on us and confronts us. And this isn't just negative talk, right? In the, in the age of, of positive thinking, uh, of the Joel Osteen, Oprah theology, where we look to puff people up with positive talk, this isn't negative. Most of God's instruction to his people is corrective. They're walking in a particular way, and God, through prophets, through poets, through apostles, through human authors, he presses in on us and he corrects us. And he does that for our wholeness. God's desire is to make us more whole, to make us more complete. So like a careful physician, God models and he speaks of behaviors and dispositions that are going to make us more whole. So even when God is correcting us in his word, it's not just a list of don't, 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 and you feel like you're sort of sitting in a dark room and hoping that you don't ever think about anything. Don't, 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 don't. That's not what God is doing. His instruction is always to try to make us more whole. And this is what Jesus means when he tells his followers to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Now we take the word perfect um, and we instantly think, well, we could never possibly do that, even though that's not what Jesus said. Uh, he did say to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. What that means is it's wholeness. It's health. So when he says to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, he's saying to be whole or to be healthy. Now, in order to do that, we have to talk about sin. You can't hear the solution without knowing the problem. So when we go back to 2 Timothy, when it says correction, what do we need to be corrected from? Sin. When it says that uh, the man of God, so for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work, what is that? It's how we walk away from sin. And how do we think of sin? Having a bit of a contest with myself to see how many times I can say the word, because we always in this modern culture have to think of a different way to say it. Sin feels like a, an archaic way of talking about it. But we often think of sin in terms of missing the mark. And that's completely appropriate. Uh, many of the words that the Bible uses for sin, that's exactly what it means. Uh, if you are an archer, you are shooting an arrow, you go wide left, you've missed the mark. That's one of the ways that the Bible defines sin. We fail, we try again. We fail, we try again. We continue to miss the mark. I have to confess, though, that that's never really invigorated me to stop sinning. That image for sin, 
uh, always leaves me feeling a little bit hopeless. It makes me feel like I just have to try harder. And my own experience is that trying harder doesn't yield the results that I'm looking for. It might just be my personality, but it's only discouraging. So when you drop a fly ball out in left field, this will be first first-hand personal experience, not once but twice. You can keep hitting me the ball, but I'm likely to keep dropping it. You could say, try again, try again. I'm going to keep missing, okay? I remember a story that Cynthia told. I think it was her youth pastor growing up or a teacher in her Christian school who, out of a strong desire to help people feel successful, made you bat until you got a hit, <laughs> And she just, she remembers standing there for what felt like 10 years as she just, she just couldn't hit the ball. So no matter how many times, no matter how slow he pitched, he could stand right in front of her and just pop the ball up in front of her. She just couldn't do it. And she, she remembers that, um, I mean, she can look back on it and laugh now, but no matter what, she, she wasn't going to get a hit. So this idea of missing the mark always leads me to think of trying harder. And that doesn't always work. Now, if that is something that works, that's something that helps you invigorate you to contend with sin in your life, that's awesome. It's true, it's biblical, I, I wouldn't deny any of that for a second. But I feel sometimes for myself, like I'm trying to hit the target on the dunk tank, and I just have to keep plucking down a dollar and, and trying again until I get it, and I, it just doesn't work. It's sort of the equivalent of, uh, if you've seen the Bob Newhart skit, I know it's one of Pastor Fred's favorites, and he's shown it here before, where... Uh, Bob Newhart is the psychiatrist, and this person comes in is expressing their anxiety, and his, his sage advice is, just stop it. <laughs> it it's, really, it it's a really funny skit, but how many of us are like that? Well, if you just stop it, like, oh, that hadn't occurred to me before. I should just stop it. If, you know, if that, that's kind of how I feel with the missing the mark thing. If I could just stop it, I would have already done that by now. Uh, which means that I'm, I'm not capable of stopping it. So one quote that I want to spend a little bit of time reflecting on just really encapsulates everything I want to say uh, about sin. And it's from Simone Weil. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correct. If it, uh, but anyway, all sins are attempts to fill voids. And I think this really just captures everything I want to say about sin, any sin. Any behavior or disposition that God would press in on and try to correct. Now, a void is something that's lacking. So consider any sin. Let's consider gossip, okay? What void does gossip fill? If I can loudly and frequently tear another person down with my words, that will draw your attention away from me. So what is the void that I'm trying to fill? I don't want you looking too closely at my life. So what I do is I deflect by gossiping frequently about other people. If I could draw your attention to them, then you're not looking at me. What about lust? What void does lust or the rampant addiction to pornography fill? It's a shortcut to the God-given blessing of intimacy with another person. You isolate one aspect of a relationship, which God has ordained is good. You isolate one aspect of that relationship, and you try to get rid of all the messy stuff, the conversations, the arguments, the disagreements. You're trying to just focus on that one aspect of a relationship. You're trying to take a shortcut. And you're not going to experience genuine intimacy. It's just not going to happen uh, because you're trying to isolate that one aspect. So what is the void that you're trying to fill? Frankly, we're too lazy to have a real whole relationship with another human being. Uh, it's just easier that way. We'll take, we'll take the shortcut. What about the sin of jealousy? What's the void there? The void is that I'm not confident. Now, I believe that every single person in this sanctuary right now, every single person outside this sanctuary right now is created in God's image, regardless of their circumstances. Everybody is created in God's image. Everybody is unique. 
Everybody has a contribution they can make. They all have different gifts. They all have different aptitudes. They all have different passions. Every single person bears the image of God. And they should be confident in that. Not everybody is the same. Everybody makes a unique contribution to their relationships, to their work, to their church, whatever. Everybody's got something going there. But what about jealousy? Jealousy is, I'm not confident in those things. Yeah, I might believe that I'm created in God's image. I might believe that I have gifts and aptitudes. But boy, they have a nicer car than I do. Or their house is bigger. Or I can't play the guitar like they can. Or I'm not. You see how you start to stockpile these things. If you go back to Genesis 3, I think that's really the heart of the fall. What was it that Eve was tempted to? You could be like God, knowing good and evil. You're sowing the seed there of discontentment and jealousy. So what void does it fill? I'm not confident, so I'm always going to focus on someone else's circumstances and not my own. What about the sin of anger? What void does that fill? Well, if I take my cues from James 4.1, he says, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? You're envious, and you can't get. So you fight and quarrel. What's the source of anger? It's your frustration over the things that you don't have. So what void does anger fill? It allows you to compensate uh, for the things that you don't have. Now, all sins... I believe it's correct, are attempts to fill voids. Now, for the next couple weeks, I'd like to look at some passages about what Scripture says about our words. So this is an area of our life where God just presses in on us and desires to bring about wholeness, holiness, health, the use of our words, the need for what I'm calling responsible speech. And I think that this is really an apt word for our day. Um, Not just in the ways that we verbalize to one another, uh, but the onset of social media, the amount of just, frankly, caustic words that get used in public spaces, the thoughtlessness behind some of the things that are said and posted. Um, People use a lot of words, and they express a lot of ideas uh, in a lot of different ways, during fellowship time, in community with other people, at work, on social media. It seems like we're just constantly being inundated with people's thoughts and their words on different subjects. Now, some of that's wonderful. Uh, Some of it's a great gift, uh, because that's what words are. That's how God created things, by use of words. Yet at the same time, we need to discern, am I listening to something wise here or not? We need to learn, what is it exactly that Scripture says about our words? So I'd like to focus on that if I can. And the series isn't designed to be a list of things you shouldn't do. Okay, so I want to frame this not positively, but constructively. 2 Timothy 3, again, uh, says the purpose of correction is so that God's people can be equipped for every good work. There's a positive intention there, that you might be equipped for every good work. The purpose of correction in the Bible is always to open you up into a larger, much more enriching experience. Now, to frame this as, as constructively as I can, just imagine uh, what it would look like if we showed up here week after week and we were blessing each other with our collective wisdom. Evel talked about this in Sunday school a few months ago, uh, and I just thought it was really a beautiful vision of what community should be, especially for Christians, where we come together corporately to worship Uh, and to edify each other. But Evel's point was that you might have the answer for what somebody is struggling with. Like you might have wisdom and insight into that. So just imagine um, 
everyone collectively just exercising great care and discernment in their words, that every word is, is born of the wisdom of the Lord, and we're sharing that uh, with each other. And just imagine how edifying that would be, right? Recognizing that this is not a social group, but it's a purpose, the purpose of the church is for us to come together and reorient ourselves to the truth. So imagine how compelling it would be to have the confidence of knowing that your words played a positive role in somebody else's life, that they were life-giving to somebody else. Now, I don't know about you. Um, I don't know what your motivation for being here is. Uh, there's a, a fair amount of diversity in that, I'm sure. But I just imagine walking away from here with the sense that I built somebody up in the Lord and that being a very positive thing. Not that I hung out with anybody or talked about things that don't really matter, but that we walked away and we spoke the truth in love and we built each other up in the faith and we were able to re-enter our week tomorrow having that truth uh, saturating us, I guess for lack of a better way to put it. So the confidence that comes from that, but then the confidence of knowing that those words come out of your own intimacy with God, right? I think a lot of us, if we're honest, experience a fair amount of doubt, uh, a lack of self-confidence in our relationship with the Lord, or, you know, there's a lot of different things. But imagine knowing that your intimacy with God overflowed and blessed other people. I just find that to be compelling. And I think that it's uh, biblical. So this isn't just a, a list of don'ts. Uh, it's, it's an invitation to do, to be more, to do more with your words. So we're going to look at a few different things. Uh, next week, I'd like to take a look at what Scripture says about how we talk to God in prayer and, frankly, how we talk about God. Scripture actually has a fair amount to say on how we talk about God. After that, I'd like to look at how we talk to one another and how we talk about one another, because Scripture has a lot to say about that. And I'd like to round it out with one of my favorite stories uh, from the whole Bible is an encounter that Jesus has uh, where the same situation is happening to two different people, and he meets both of their needs with very different sets of words, but a very different disposition toward both of them. And I think in all of this, what I want to recognize is how compelling a figure Jesus is by how multifaceted his words are. One of the really interesting things about Jesus is that nobody was in between in their thinking about him. Nobody was ambivalent. Nobody was in the middle. I think that when people traveled from a distance to see him, uh, it was almost like, I just have to check out what's happening here. I mean, you hear about the, the mighty deeds of Jesus, about the raising of the dead and the healing of the sick, but you look at how he uses his words, and we have this sort of cookie-cutter vision of who Jesus is. Um, some of those words are just blatantly offensive to us. If I were to somehow project them up in a way and maybe hide a little bit of the translation and not tell you that they're from the Bible, you'd look at that and say, oh, it's so negative. And then I could flash underneath it. Well, actually, Jesus said it. And then, oh, right, that is exactly what I would have said in that same circumstance. Um, but if you, if you let it be what it is, Jesus is so multifaceted in what he does in his words, I think he's calling us to the same. We have this kind of canned approach with how we use our words. But Jesus confronts people. He offers a word of grace when people need it. He offers a word of rebuke, very stinging rebuke to some people. Right? And we think that somehow we're not obligated to that same multifaceted use of words. So we're going to uh, we're gonna look at all those things. Uh, but before we do that, let's put first things first. So today, I want to spend just a couple minutes convincing you of a simple premise. And it is that words are never just words. According to Scripture, words reveal the condition of the heart. 
So words are never just words. And just so that you're any potential disagreements here, uh, you can disagree with the Bible. I'm not really interested in whether you agree with me or not. I want your argument to be with the text. So if you don't think that's true, um, your argument is with Jesus, not with me. Um, you can have it out with him. Uh, words are never just words. You never say something unless it is partly a condition of your heart. So several years ago, um, the name escapes me. I'm going to say Kramer. Michael, Michael Richards, thank you, went on this tirade. He was, he's a comedian, um, was in a, in a club doing an act, and went on this incredibly racist tirade. Um, it was highly publicized. I mean, it was years ago. But he spent time in his apologies saying that I have no idea where that came from. Now, that might be true. He might have no idea where that came from. What Scripture would say in those instances, it came from what is festering within you. And that's the same of everybody here, myself included. Jesus said, you brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. That's what Jesus means. The mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The reason you say those things is because that's what's in your heart. Words don't just come out of nowhere. They don't just spring up from inside us as though we have no idea what's going on. Our attitudes, our dispositions, the words that we use will reveal those. He says the same thing in Luke, where he says the good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills the heart. A slightly different translation is out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. I don't know how many of us, myself included, consider that every single, every single, is that, every single thing we thought, sorry, sorry this little side, um, every single thing that we say, every word that we use reveals a condition of our heart. That should be, at least for me, when I consider that, I cringe internally and when I'm not in front of you, I cringe externally as well in terms of, I can't believe uh, that I just said that. And what's even more depressing is, I can't believe that there's a condition of my heart that made it seem to me like that was an okay thing to say. But I'm stuck with the truth. I may not want to believe it, but this is what Jesus says. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So words are not just words. They indicate a condition of the heart. You got some anger? Your words are going to follow. Got some angst about people? That's going to come out. Got joy? Your words are going to show it. Got cynicism? Your words are going to show that too. Your words... Now we gather here and we can pretend for a while but ultimately, your words will reveal the condition of your heart. You will be revealed. Um, again, the condition of your heart will be revealed. You got love. You got angst. That stuff's going to come out. And the real problem that I have with that, and some of us have had this discussion before, is once you start to infuse those words with angst, there's not wisdom there. So I have to decide, is the correction that you're giving me born out of a real godly desire for my transformation, or is it because you have unexpressed angst about me? Does that make sense? So when I sit down for my triennial evaluation, the principal comes into the room, 
writes everything that I do and say, which is a really, frankly, horrifying thing. Um, because that's what they do. They record literally everything that you say in the midst of a lesson. And you think, I don't even remember saying that, but it definitely seems like something I would say. I have to sit there during this review and I have to say, okay, is this expressing what's in my best interest or does my boss just not like me? You imagine how the evaluation could be different. When you mess up in your use of words. If somebody's predisposed to liking you, you're gonna be okay, ah, we all make mistakes. But if they don't, all of a sudden, misspelling in the PowerPoint presentation becomes like the most significant deal ever. You will express moral outrage over something as inconsequential as my misspelling of the word evil. Made you look, uh, I don't know, I hope it's not misspelled. But you see the difference, and you see how there's wisdom in one and not in the other. The person who can really be trusted in the wisdom of their words is the person who can speak truth regardless of how they feel about you. They don't have to like you to express the truth. And that's the problem. Once you start to taint your words with the overflow of the heart, the question becomes, can we really trust each other uh, with our words? And that is what I feel God really wants to press in on as a community of believers, as followers of the Lord Jesus. I think that that is what the vision of community should be, that we don't have to like each other, but we can trust each other's collective wisdom. I can accept the truth from you whether or not we see eye to eye on everything and vice versa. So that's what Jesus says. Eventually, your words will show the condition of your heart. Now, in a fun little cross-reference here, in Isaiah, can you read that? Way in the back there? It's probably easier if you turn your head. There's a TV screen right back there. Uh, but anyway, no extra charge for that. So Isaiah says, uh, for a fool speaks nonsense and his heart inclines toward wickedness. Now the fool is not an unintelligent person, okay? Th this is a person who willfully chooses to incline his heart towards sin. And because his heart is oriented that way, his words will be nonsense. Now the word fool does not mean unintelligent. It means that this person's heart is inclined toward godlessness and therefore their words are nonsense. And it goes on to say, to practice ungodliness and to speak error against the Lord, to keep the hungry person unsatisfied and to withhold drink from the thirsty. So their agenda is a self-serving, self-exalting one. They're not unintelligent. They're not innocent. They're not accidentally speaking error against God. They're trying to suppress other people. So instead of expressing God's character of love and of justice, they're manipulating words. They're manipulating other people, right? And that's what it says, to withhold drink from the thirsty, to keep the hungry person unsatisfied. And because their heart is inclined toward this behavior, their words will always be nonsense. So that's exactly what I'm talking about, is once you orient the heart or incline it toward angst or toward sin or toward self-exalting, selfish gain, all of a sudden your words just can't be trusted anymore. And that, I think, is a problem. James, in what is likely a famous passage, says, does a fountain send out from the same opening, both fresh and bitter water. Can a fig tree, my brethren, ooh, brethren, nice, produce olives or a vine produce figs? Neither can salt water produce fresh. So you can't have it both ways. I think what James is doing here is tying together your heart and your words. You can't have blessing and cursing coming from the same mouth. You can't have fresh water and salt water coming from the same spring. So I'll insert the words of Jesus again. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So our problem is a heart problem. Now, one quote from Gary Thomas 
which I think really captures this nicely. It's on the insert in your bulletin. All these passages, by the way, I haven't printed them off in the bulletin, but the references are all there if you want to go back and look at them. Um, I just project them up there so that we're not flipping to 19 different places in the Bible. Um, But Gary Thomas says it this way, My discoveries about growth began when I realized other people do not make me irritable or anything else. They only bring out the inner man that has been secretly marinating in the juices of irritability. I just love that quote. (laughs) Nobody makes you do anything. Okay? Fathers, your kids don't drive you crazy. They bring out the crazy that was always there. (laughs) So one of the quotes I love, it, it, it applied to mothers. I think it equally applies to fathers. Sometimes I open my mouth and my mother comes out. Same thing with dads. Sometimes I open my mouth and my dad comes out. Southside over on Jewish Street has, uh, I, I should take a picture of it to send it to my dad. It says, the older I get, the smarter my dad seems to get. But in those instances, nobody makes you do anything. All they do is they show what was already there. Right? So this irritability. He's, I think in that situation, uh, Thomas is just talking about how his family, perhaps his wife, were somehow making, uh, were irritating him in some way. And his reflection was, they don't make me irritable. All they do is just expose what was already there. They bring out the inner man. And this idea of bringing out the inner man is precisely what Jesus was talking about. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it's a rather bleak picture, frankly. Um, This is where we can lose sight of the fact that God is inviting us to more. Now this can be a discouraging prospect, um, but it's where we need to be reminded that this is not meant to make us feel like hopeless failures. It's not an opportunity for us to try harder, to pull ourselves up by our spiritual bootstraps and to do better. What we need to do is we need to go deep on these issues. We've all failed. Every single person sitting right here, right now, has that in common. We've all failed. We've all said terrible things. We've all maligned the character of another person because we were insecure. I don't believe there's a single person here that that's not true of. We've all treated people like things with the way that we use our words. We've all manipulated people with our words. We've all taken the opportunity to take shots at other people with our words, either in openly aggressive ways or in passive aggressive ways. We've all made passive-aggressive remarks that reflect the world more than they reflect Jesus. We've spewed hateful things because we felt like we could get away with it. I believe, if not all of those are true, I just check D, all of the above, uh, for myself personally. But all of us have abused our words. We've abused other people with our words. We have all failed. This is an invitation, though, to more. And I think that once we see that our problem is a heart problem, then we have constructive ways forward. We're all guilty. And you know what? We were always guilty. We were only ever always guilty. I don't think that makes sense. But all you can do then is all you were ever able to do is to repent to put yourself openly before the Lord and to confess. To pray earnestly that God would change you from the inside out. For God to reorient our heart. So the prayer becomes not, God, help me to stop saying these things. God, help me to be more constructive in my words. God, help me to be more of a blessing to other people. The prayer becomes, God, orient my heart toward you so that it's just the overflow 
the wisdom, the love, the grace, the rebuke, the correction, all of it is the overflow of my heart. I think that's what God wants to do. Um, And I think that the carelessness of words in our society, um, in our churches, I think it destroys lives. I think it destroys people's character. I think it erodes their confidence in the ways that God has made them. And I think that this is something, among other things, that God would change. So God's invitation uh, to all of us is to make us into men and women, mothers and fathers, friends and neighbors, husbands and wives, who open themselves up to the lordship of Christ in this area. And like anything else, anything worth doing is difficult. So to have God reorient your heart, that's a pretty radical prospect. When you go back to Jeremiah Um, not our Jeremiah, but the prophet Jeremiah. Human beings have to have their heart removed and replaced. Right? So in our sinful inclination, in our sinful nature, we are going to look for self-exalting ways of being in the world. God has to change our heart. None of us here is capable. I don't care who the guru is. It doesn't work unless God's operative in it. So my hope in looking at these passages and reflecting and having these conversations together is that God might get a hold of our words. Not that we would um, not define it negatively, but that our community life together uh, would be a blessing, that everybody comes together with the wisdom of their words. We use them in constructive ways, and God just gets a hold of that. So I put a list of questions there for further reflection. As you start to think uh, about words, one question is, with every sentence, what does this word indicate about the condition of my heart? So what I'm about to say, if you're in a scenario where you're having a conversation, what do my words show about the condition of my heart? Do I feel the need to be clever in this moment? Do I feel the need to be passive aggressive? Do I feel the need to take a shot at somebody? And then, first of all, the filter somewhere around here, you shut that down before it comes out. And then you start to think, why do I feel like I need to do that? And I think, I could be wrong, before the words come out. Because one of the other things about words in our culture is the entitlement we feel to say whatever we're thinking. Um, And for one who works amongst younger generations, that tide is going to be incredible (laughs) in terms of the entitlement that people feel like if they think it, they need to say it, and it needs to be affirmed. That's dangerous. Very, very, very dangerous. Um, So to stop and think, is this a life-giving word for the person that I'm talking to? What does it say about the condition of my heart? Am I insecure? Or am I saying this from a place of real security? Uh, Am I jealous? Am I competing? Am I judging? And most, if not all of us, are just saying, well, no, I'm just saying. It's sort of like no offense, Nothing positive in the whole history of the human race has ever followed that statement. No offense, but what I'm going to say is really going to offend you. But I said no offense, and then I ended it with just saying, yikes. (laughs) The things that we can say to each other, well, I prefaced it with no offense. Or with all due respect, was another one of my favorites which I'm guessing, based on what follows, wasn't very much. (laughs) As much due respect as, as you deserve. Things like that can become very dangerous. And I think that what Scripture 
says in Proverbs and in a lot of other places is we have to take great care in the words that we use. Um, so as you start to reflect on your words, maybe these questions uh, might help. A, a final one is, do my words build up? And then a good follow-up question to that is, who do my words build up? Um, am I building up another person with the truth? Uh, am I speaking what's true about God? Am I tr speaking what's true about the spiritual life? Like, when I say that God's blessing is upon something, some of us, I think, we're just positive about things instead of saying, like, boy, is this something that we should really be affirming? Um, are we speaking the truth in love, I think, is, is how I might want to say it. But I think that as we, as we spend this time together and as we think about these things, I just hope that it's a, an opportunity for us to shine our light before each other uh, and before this culture, that this culture might see uh, Jesus. Let's pray.